Welcome to the second lecture for 15445, 15645, Database Systems at Carnegie Mellon. As I said in my last lecture, I'm not on campus right now. Joel and I had to take Inf uh, to surrender himself. So right now we're in a safe house off Flatbush in, in Brooklyn. And Joel's not here right now. He went with Inf to the police station and he's, he's dealing with that. Uh, it's, it, it's not looking good. It's probably going to be uh, quite a while. Like he might not get out until twenty three. So it is what it is. Uh, you know, as I said multiple times, if you get involved in databases, some crazy stuff can happen, and you know, sometimes you sort of end up in jail. But that's that's the sort of life we live when we, when when we do databases. So uh, it's around like two in the morning right now. Um, but we will be packing up probably in a day or two and heading back to, to CMU to, to you know, proceed with the rest of the lectures in class. So I just want to give a quick shout out to our people who's been helping us out. So Steezy EPC Jones in, in Brooklyn, JL in Seattle, and SFO Mohan for helping us out in our time of need and, and taking care of us. So we, we really appreciate that. So for today's lecture, we're now going to be t talking about relational algebra. And so I admit the original title or the topic for this lecture was going to be Relational Algebra and Relational Calculus. Um, but then as I sort of sat and thought about it, I realized that uh, for the purposes of what we care about in this class, we don't really need to know. So I'll cover a little bit just so you know it exists. But our focus really is going to be on uh, Relational Algebra. So just some quick administrative things to deal with. Uh, homework one is out released it uh, last class, and it'll be due on Wednesday, September 13th, and there's instructions online on how to do that. And then also uh, in the same week, on Monday, September 11th, we will release the first programming assignment, a programming project for the class. Um, and so we'll provide you with instructions in the download of how to get started with that on that day, and I'll cover a little about it in class of, of how to get started and what's expected. Um, so there's not really anything you can do to prepare for this other than being comfortable with writing C++ code, C++11 code, and pro, you know debugging it with GDB or Valorant, whatever you want to use. All right, and then that'll be due later in, uh, in September. All right, as I said, in today's class, I want to spend a little time talking about a bit more about the relational model. We were a bit rushed last time, and I want to cover uh, some background information about it a bit more. And then we'll spend most of our time talking about relational algebra, and we'll look a, look a little bit at relational calculus, and then we'll finish off with looking at some alternative data models or sort of alternatives to the relational model, um, and you get an idea of, of what these look like and how they actually relate to the relational model. So in order to really understand the significance of the relational model, it's, we kind of need to go back in time and, and see what life was like before it existed. Um, I remember when I first learned the relational model, I remember thinking like, oh, this is sort of obvious, right? This is clearly the way you would want to you know, represent data in a database. Uh, you know, why would anybody do anything else? And this is sort of a testament to the, I think the importance of the relational model or just in some ways it's, it's, it's simplicity. It's one of those things where, you know, after it's been discovered, it seems so obvious to everyone. And right? it seems so obvious that like, oh, of course, it's the way you'd want to do it, right? How would you do it any, any, any way else? And so you have to understand, though, before the relational model in the 1960s, uh, people were using other data models, the hierarchical data model or the network data model. And these are sort of... Uh, uh, you know, relics of, of history. They're not necessarily, you know, for us to go study and see exactly how they work. Um, but the sort of the, the major thing to understand about these early database systems was that they were actually really difficult to build applications on top of and actually maintain them over time. And a big part of this is because that there was sort of no clean separation between the what I'll call the logical layers of the database and the physical layers. So you can think of the logical layer as being describing what the database looks like. You know, what, what tables do I have? What attributes do they have? Um, and then the physical layer would be how it's actually stored, you know, in memory or on disk. 
So to give an example of this, of what I mean, is one of the first database systems was developed by IBM, the system called IMS, Information Management System. Uh, and they developed it for the, the original you know, moon mission, the Apollo moon mission, to keep track of all the parts they were, they were purchasing for the, for the rocket. And, and IMS is actually still around today. It's, it's still u widely used in, in a lot of older institutions. And so the way IMS would work is that you would write your application and you would declare you know, what tables you had, what collections of data you had. And then would you, would you would de declare how you wanted the database system to actually store it. So you could say, for example, this table should be stored using some kind of tree data structure, and this other table should be stored using a, uh, using a hash table. And then depending on what data structure you end up using, this would then expose different uh, API methods for you to interact with the data. So for example, if you chose a hash table, you could then do you know, point queries on it, but you couldn't do range queries. But if you chose a tree data structure, you could, you could do both of them. And so the, in order to make this decision about what physical data structure you would use for your, for your logical tables, you had to basically know what all the queries your application would ever possibly execute uh, before you deploy the database. Because the problem was, if you say, I, you know, at some point in time, I, I only need to do point queries or sort of single key lookups, therefore I can use a hash table because that's faster. But then if your application then changes and now you need to support some kind of range query, you're not going to be able to do that efficiently on the hash table. And so what people end up having to do was, if you had to you know, change what data structure you're using, you had to not only dump the data out, and then reload it back in, you know, going from a hash table to a, a tree. But then you actually had to go through your application code and modify it so that it would make uh, it, would, it would invoke the tree calls instead of the hash table calls. So around this time in the late 1960s, there was a, a mathematician uh, named Ted Codd that was hired at IBM in New York, and he was sort of going around and he was seeing all of these IBM programmers spending you know, time over and over again modifying or changing their database application code anytime the database physical data structure changed or the schema changed. Because there was all of this um, information about what the database looked like at, sort of the, at, the, at the physical level baked into the application code. So if you change, like if I added a column, then I had to go change all of my application code to now deal with that extra column. And so what he developed was a mathematical concept called the relational model that was trying to solve this problem. And he published two key papers on this topic. The first was a tech report at IBM in 1969. And then this was followed up by the more full-fledged uh, paper in the communications of the ACM in 1970. And this is essentially where he proposed the, the, the relational model. And so the, the, the significance of this is that it, it provided an abstraction to avoid all that maintenance overhead that people were, had, had to deal with when dealing with the older database systems by hiding the, sort of the physical uh, uh, storage of the database from the actual logical uh, logical API and how a application could actually interact with it. So there's sort of three key principles that came out of these these first these first papers that were re revolutionary groundbreaking. And the first is that Ted Codd argued that we should store the databases uh, in in simple data structures, right? Tables, for example, um, and this is because the 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 existing database systems that were out, they were actually having these really complex hierarchical data structures. Um, and then they were you know, uh, prone to corruption because if, you, if some piece of that data structure got, got messed up on disk, then the whole database would be lost. So he argued it would be better to store sort of the, the database tables or relations as these sort of simple data structures and then build upon that uh, more complex things. The second key thing is that he argued that we, the application should only access the data through a high-level language. 
And so what I mean by that is the you would write queries on 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 your database without wor or even without knowing about exactly how the data is being stored, whether it's being indexed or not, right? You would just sort of deal with it at, at a sort of abstract level. And the sort of the this was actually a controversial idea at the time because people argued that there's no way a you know computer could ever generate a query plan that would be more efficient or better than one written by a human. Right? Sort of the same argument that people had at the time about, you know, there's no way a C compiler could ever compile queries or sorry, generate machine code that would be as efficient as somebody writing you know, a handwritten assembly. So the last principle of the relational model is that the sort of related to all of this is that the the physical storage of data was left up to the implementation of the database management system. So what I mean by that is the application doesn't know and doesn't have to care whether the data is stored on, say, on disk or in memory, whether it's stored in one file or 20 files, whether it's stored on one machine or multiple computers. It doesn't know and doesn't need to care. It's just going to deal with the writing queries using this high-level language. And what's nice about this is that the database system can then make decisions after the data is actually already stored to maybe modify how it's, the layout in memory or how it's laying out the files on disk and it can adapt it over time based on what queries you know show up and so this means that when you first loaded your database and you had all your early assumptions about what your application was going to do if that ended up changing you could then either let the system do it or you could do it as an administrator to change the, the storage of the database without changing any of your application. So these, you know, I can't underscore exactly uh, just how uh, groundbreaking the relational model was at the time. Um, it actually took about 10 years for people to acknowledge or realize that this is the right way to actually store databases. Uh, there was a lot of pushback at the time um, from the you know, existing database systems that were sort of out there. Um, although IBM, you know, Ted Codd was at IBM, and then IBM then ended up starting building uh, a relational database system prototype, one of the first relational database systems in the 1970s called System R. Uh, they started this in like 72, 73, but it, IBM actually never commercialized System R, and they didn't actually release their own relational database system until 1983, and that was DB2, which is, which is IBM's database system that's still available today. So again, this 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 seems like an obvious thing to do, um, you know. Now, you know, thirty years later, forty years later, but at the time, again, this was this was considered pretty radical, right? So, the in addition to sort of proposing the the relational model, Ted Codd actually also sort of codified or, or proposed the notion of a data model as, as itself. And so we can define a data model as being a sort of collection of, of information about how to describe the data we want to store in a database. So the relational model is sort of one example of a data model, but there's other ones that we'll talk about later in the lecture. And so this is, again, this is sort of a high level concept to describe what the data looks like. And then from there, we can then define what's called a schema which is a description of a particular collection of data for a given data model. So we can say our data model is the relational model, and then for a particular database instance, we can define the, the, the various relations that are stored inside of it, what attributes they have, what value domains those attributes can have, and so forth. So again, the, the relational model is just one type of data model that's out there. Um, we'll focus on that for for this class. I I I would say that actually I'm a I sort of come from the school of the relational database systems, and so I'm a strong adherent to its its um, to its abilities, and I think that's the right way to go for a lot of cases. Um, we'll look at these other ones uh, later in the lecture. Um, the nice thing about the relational model is that it's really flexible. So with all of these different data models here, they can be actually stored in a relational database system. It may not be the, the, the most efficient implementation, 
right? You don't want to store a matrix or an array in a relational database system. It's usually a bad idea. Um, but you know, it's flexible enough that you could do this. So again, we'll focus on the relational data model uh, for this, this class because this is the, this is essentially the de facto standard or the most widely used data model in database applications today. Every single major database system that's out there um, that's widely used by both you know, lar large companies, startups, small organizations across the board, they're more than, more than often they're, they're using a relational database system. So the, the relational model is comprised of th three, three ideas, th three uh, components. The first is that it's going to de describe the structure of the database, right? This is essentially the definition of the relations and their contents, what, what, what attributes and domains do they have. But then also it's going to describe the integrity uh, components of the, of the database, meaning uh, what constraints can we impose on the tuples and their attributes in our database that have to be satisfied in order for a valid tuple to be stored in it. And then lastly, we'll have the sort of defined how we manipulate our, our database, meaning how do we access and update its contents. And this is essentially what our focus, this last one is the focus of what we're, we're talking about here today, relational algebra. Um, we'll, we'll first spend a little time talking about the first two in a second. So as we defined in the last class, a relation is an unordered set that contains the relationship of attributes that represent entities in the real world. Um, to use an example of the music store we looked at last time, we could say a relation here would be the artist, right, of, the, of people putting out music, and a, a, each entry or entity within the artist relation will have a name, a year, and a country. And we can define for each of these attributes uh, the domain and values that they're allowed to have, right? So a year would be some, some year in a calendar, and a country would be some country in, in the world. So typically, or under the original definition of Ted Cobb's relational model, the values in a relation have to be atomic or, or scalar. So that means you can't have lists, you can't have arrays, you can't have sort of nested values. Uh, we'll see how we can relax that later on, and most database systems nowadays can support things like arrays or, or nested, nested objects. But under the original definition, you couldn't have that. And then there's also a special value uh, called null, which works a lot like how nulls work in programming language. It essentially means that the, the, the value is simply unknown. So we could have basically, you know, we have a value where we know something does exist, and then we can have one where we don't know it does we don't know that it exists, and that would be null. And we'll see later on how this, you know, how actually we store null and how do we actually deal with it when we do processing. So the from a just to drive home the mathematical concept or underpinnings of the relational model, in the literature in my example here, this would be referred to as an n area relation where n is the number of columns. And for our purposes in this course, we can just assume, or it's, it's given that n area relation just means a table with n columns. So the, the n area stuff will come up later on when we talk about storing, uh, storing tables actually on disk, either as a row store or as a column store, and there'll be different schemes we can use based, based on this, which we'll cover later. All right, so last class we talked a little bit about uh, candidate keys, but I want to walk through an example to show exactly uh, how, how these work. So for every relation, it has to have at least one candidate key that uniquely identifies one and only one tuple. And so in our example here uh, of the artist relation, uh, there's actually several candidate keys for this, for this, data, for this relation instance. Right? We could have the name, because we only have three tuples and the name's always unique. We could have a combination of name and year, name and country, or all three tuples, or sorry, all three attributes, name, year, and country, because right? all of these are, 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 are unique. But again, so in this, for these candidate keys, these are tied to this specific instance of, of this relation. If we modify the contents, then these, these will no longer be candidate, you know, possible candidate keys because they're not going to uniquely identify tuples. So to give an example, let's say that uh, Joy goes back to India and for whatever reason he starts a new hip-hop group and he names his, his group Ice Cube. 
right? And so now the, the name by itself, the name attribute can't be a candidate key because now there are two artists in our relation that have the same, same name. I don't know why Joy would do this because uh, Ice Cube probably, the real Ice Cube probably would not like this uh, and he probably would have some words with Joy. But for whatever reason, Joy decided to do this. But now let's say that somebody else in the United States decides, oh, I'm also going to start a group and I'm going to call them Ice Cube. Um, so now name and year can't be a candidate key because that's not going to uniquely identify uh, a tuple. And then let's say somebody else is also even more crazy and there's a third group called Ice Cube also in the United States that also started in 2017. So now in this, this example, none of these are, are, are candidate keys for this relation because any combination of them does not uniquely identify a single tuple. So in the last lecture, I showed how we can rectify this by imposing or in, in adding a sort of synthetic, synthetic ID column that we can guarantee to be unique across every single tuple. So now in this example, uh, any combination of the attributes that includes the ID field is considered a candidate key because it's always guaranteed to be unique. So ID by itself is always unique and therefore any adding any additional attribute is, is, is also unique. So these are all still valid candidate keys, even though they, they seem somewhat redundant. So now the primary key is sort of a uh, selected candidate key that is deemed more important than the other candidate keys. So in this case here, the ID, the ID attribute by itself is enough to uniquely identify uh, any any tuple, and it's the minimum number of attributes you need to do this. So therefore, we could designate this as as the primary key. And so the primary keys will show up later on when we talk about uh, query processing and, and integrity exchange and things like that. Um, typically, this you know this is something that you as a application developer would have to declare. The database system is not going to do this for you. You can create tables in some database systems without primary keys. But usually what happens then, they then install one of these uh, synthetic IDs, these sequence IDs, as the internal primary key. So MySQL, for example, if you don't declare a primary key, then it uses uh, the row ID as, as, as the primary key. And then internally for all its bookkeeping and how it tracks you know, what tuples, uh, what indexes point to what tuples and things like that, it'll use this internal ID. So again, we'll see we'll see this a lot later on when we actually talk about uh, row storage or uh, tuple storage. So we also talk about foreign keys, and the foreign key is a way to uh, record that there is a relationship between two different relations, right? In this example here for this database, we said an artist would put out albums. And we said there was a uh, one-to-many relationship between an artist and an album. So an, an artist can appear on multiple albums. It's actually, sorry, many-to-many. -many. So an artist can appear on multiple albums, an album can have uh, multiple artists. So the issue we had to deal with is how we actually were going to store this. So in the case of this first album here, we only have one, uh, one artist, and so we can store that as a scalar, and that's not a problem. But for the, uh, the second one, Right, this guy would have multiple artists appearing on this mixtape. So under the, the original definition of the relational model, we can't store a list here, right? So we can't, there's no way we can actually store this natively in the database with multiple entries. And so the way we, we would model this is that we would create a new sort of cross-reference table that can map the artist ID from to, to an album. So in this case here, we have two columns in this, this, this relation and the artist ID maps to the artist table and the album ID maps to the album table. And then now in the album uh, relation, we don't need to store the, uh, the artist ID in, 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 anymore. That's stored separately in this cross-reference -re relation. And so in the artist album relation as well, we recorded the, uh, we mark the artist ID, the combination of the artist ID and the album ID is the primary key. And this ensures that the same artist cannot appear on the same album in our database multiple times. And we designate the primary key of a relation by, by the underline. All right, so that's, again, that's sort of the, the, the same thing we talked about last class in terms of what the relational model looks like for the things that we care about.
But now we want to talk about actually how we're actually going to store and retrieve information from our, our relational database. And there's essentially two classes of what are called data manipulation languages, DMLs, to, to store and retrieve information from the database. The first is a, uh, a, a class of languages called procedural languages or navigational languages. And these are where the query is going to specify some high level strategy that the database system can use in order to compute the answer that the, the user wants on, on, on the data. And the alternative is a non-procedural uh, language where the query only specifies what data it actually wants and doesn't tell the database system anything about how to find it. So the first class, the procedural languages, this is, this is what relational algebra is. And when I say the high level strategy or the strategy how to execute the query, I don't mean in the terms of like low level operations on data structures or, you know, I'm not saying like, you know, if we want to sort data that we should use quick sort instead of bubble sort, or if you want to do a join, we should use a hash join instead of a sort merge join. I just mean sort of the steps you need to take in order to, to compute the answer. The second one is what relational calculus is. And this is actually what SQL is, is derived from or based on. Right? In SQL, you specify, here's the answer that I want, but you don't tell the data system exactly how to compute it. So then it runs through the, the planner and the optimizer, and then it thinks, figures out the best strategy to actually do this for you. So again, for our purposes, we care about, in this course, the relational algebra. And that's because when we actually uh, in build a database system that execute, uh, you know, SQL queries that are sent to us from the application, what we're going to be operating on are a is, a is a plan tree that's comprised of relational algebra operators. And the non-procedural stuff, or the relational calculus, this is what you would actually use if you want to define a or create a new programming language to, to replace SQL. You would want to base it off a uh, relational calculus. Again, since this is not a programming language theory course, uh, we don't care about this. SQL is good enough for us. It's not the you know it's not a perfect language, uh, but it's 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 pretty good. It covers most things, and so we're going to focus on relational algebra because that's what we need to know. And this will come up multiple times when we actually start building a database system and have to actually execute queries. So the relational algebra that Ted Codd defined in 1970 was originally comprised of seven basic operations. And these are again the, the fundamental uh, primitives that we can use to write queries to retrieve and manipulate tuples in our relation. So this is actually originally based on uh, set algebra. So if you've taken a discrete math course or taken any kind of set theory course, a lot of these concepts should be should be pretty straightforward. Uh, but then Ted Codd also added some additional, uh, three additional operators that are specific to operating on, on relations in, in a database. So the uh, some of these operations will be uh, unary, meaning they take in one relation and output another, and some will be binary, meaning they take two relations as input and, and output another. But all these operators are always gonna produce a new relation as its output. And so what will happen is we'll be able to chain together uh, multiple operators in succession and have the output of one operator be the input for the next operator. And this is going to allow us to uh, implement more complex queries than, we, than the, these basic primitives can do. And for, mo for what we'll talk about here, this will cover most of the kind of things you, you'd want to do in SQL. So now there were extensions to relational algebra, both from Ted Codd and others, uh, later in the 1970s and early 1980s. Um, if I'm, for, this, for this lecture, I'm going to mostly focus on the original definition. Uh, anytime we deviate and talk about the extensions, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that. Um, and I would say most of the extensions are sort of just things you sort of need to do, the kind of things you'd want to do with, 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 with SQL. All right, so the first operator is the select. Uh, 
And so I think in the original uh, in the original works, they maybe call this restrict instead of select. Um, and because the way to think about it is not necessarily select like you write a, a select statement in SQL. It's more like we're going to choose a subset of tuples uh, from our relation and produce that as our, as our output. And we'll choose that subset by restricting which ones we actually emit in the output. And this will be based on a selection predicate. So this predicate is going to act as a filter to only emit the tuples that fulfill it, uh, that, that evaluate to true. And so we can, we can generate more complex predicates by combining them together using conjunctions and disjunctions. And then we follow the same sort of Boolean logic you would in, in any discrete math course. So the syntax is to have the lowercase sigma, which is nice because it's easy to remember select is with S and sigma is S. And then you have in a subscript, you define the predicate and then you def and within the parentheses, you define the relation you want to do the select on. So say we have a simple relation like this, we define it as AID, BID, and we just have these, these four tuples. So we can write a, uh, a query using the select operator by defining that our predicate is where AID equals A2, and that, that'll produce these tuples here. And we can do more complex things, as I said, using conjunctions and disjunctions. And now we can say, you know, select the tuples from R, where AID equals A2 and BID is, is greater than 10. All right, so this look, if, if, you know, if, you're, if you understand SQL, this should look very familiar, but this is essentially uh, how we would represent a SQL query like this, right? This is what it, get, it would get converted into the corresponding relational algebra query, right? So this is a select star from R, and then we have that same predicate that we had in, in the second example. The next operator is to do projection. And with projection, what we're doing is we're going to output a new relation that has tuples that only contain the specified attributes that we have in our, in our, in our projection list. And so with this, we can rearrange the, 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 the ordering of the attributes in our output. And then although this is not in the original uh, definition of the relational model, we can, uh, something's going on. But now we're cool. Now we're, all right, you got it? All right, sorry. Um, so uh, although this was not in the original definition of the relational model from Ted Codd, uh, we can actually also manipulate the values of attributes when we output them in our, in our, uh, in our new, new relation. So we define this using the lowercase pi symbol. And again, this is nice, easy to remember because pi starts with P, projection starts with P. Uh, and then we have the list of our attributes defined that we want to uh, emit from our relation. So using that same table example from the last slide, uh, I can do a projection like this where I would say, uh, first do a select on the R relation and filter anything where AID equals A2. And then in my projection, I will take BID as the output, subtract 100 from it, and which is again manipulating its value, and then uh, also emit AID. So in the original relational model, the, the, there's no real ordering to attributes, but in practice, when, when, we, when we look at it, we usually see these things. And again, so we can manipulate the order of, of our output here. And so this is equivalent to the SQL query like this, where again, you just have your projection list Right before, right after the select clause, um, and th this will this will produce the same result. And this is actually another example here in my relational algebra of daisy chaining together the different operators to do more complex things. So I did the select first, followed by the projection. All right, so now we can get into the the binary operators, and again, these should be these are just exactly as you'd expect from uh, basic set theory. So the first thing is to do a union where we want to uh, generate a new relation that contains all the tuples that appear either in uh, one, the, the, the first or the second relation, or both of them, right? So again, now we have an example. We have a we have relation R, relation S. If I take the union of those two, I'll have all the tuples of R and all the tuples of S in my output. So uh, a couple of things to point out here is that 
This only works if there's the same number of uh, attributes in these, both of these relations. So if there was a third attribute in S, then I wouldn't be able to take the union because that would be undefined for the relation R. The other thing to point out too is, although in this my example here, I have the tuples ordered based on you know, R first followed by S. Again, relational model is unordered, so different database systems could, could store the or produce these outputs in any order they want, and those values would still be uh, correct or equivalent. All right, and then in SQL, uh, we have a union keyword that we can use. We can take the output of two select statements and, and, and union them together, and you get the same result. And most database management systems that are out there uh, that support SQL should support the union operator. And then in addition to union, we can also have intersection. Uh, and this is where we just, the output will only contain tuples that appear in both the relations. So in this case here, only uh, AIA, A3, 103 appears in both relations. So in our output, when we do the intersection, we would only get uh, that one tuple. And in this case here, just like in uh, union, with, uh, in, to take the intersection in SQL, there's the intersect keyword. And again, we have to have the same, uh, the same number of columns in both relations in order, to, in order for this query to work. All right, and then the last one, we can also do set difference. Uh, and this is again where we, we, the output only contains the tuples that appear in the first relation and not the second one. So in this case here, uh, A, again, A3, 103 appears in this relation, so that would not be included in the output when we take the intersection. Only the first two, the first two tuples would appear. And so for this, there's, it's not, in SQL, you don't, there's no difference keyword, uh, you would use the accept keyword. And this is, uh, this is equivalent, this is equivalent operator. All right, so then the last uh, sort of operator bar from set theory uh, is, is the product, or the, sometimes also called the Cartesian product. And so for this, what it does is it's going to generate a relation that contains all the output, all possible combinations of the two input relations. So meaning for, the way to think about this, for every single tuple in, say, R, I will then combine it with every tuple in S. And then I'll go to the next tuple in R and do, do the same thing for the other one. So now if I take the Cartesian product of these two relations, I end up with a giant uh, relation like this that has nine different en entries for every single combination of a, of a tuple in R and a tuple in S. And in SQL, there's actually two ways to do this. There's a, there's a cross-join um, uh, keyword you can use to take, take the cross-join between two relations. But also, if you just select from two relations and don't have a where clause that defines how you want to, to join these two, these these two relations together, it ends up taking the, the cross product. You get the same result. And we'll see this multiple times that there's there's many different ways sometimes to write the same query to produce the same result. And it's not always the case that the, the, the two queries are run exactly the same way. The different database systems have different optimizers with different capabilities and one end up main being faster than another. So now you, so you look at this, 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 the cross product or the Cartesian product here, and this seems kind of like kind of a useless thing to do. Um, right? why, why would anybody actually want to do, do something like this? Um, it, I will say it actually just shows up in a, a couple of different scenarios. Um, like in testing, for example, if you want to take all possible combinations of two data sets to do testing on them, you could use a cross join uh, if you just want to sort of get a, you know, create a matrix of all possible combinations for doing some kind of valuation or analysis, uh, Cartesian product cross join would do the same kind of thing. So now the 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 next operator is actually sort of a, a, sort, of a sort of superset of the the cross join, uh, and that is just a straight join in 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 the relational algebra. And what this is doing that it's going to come join together the two tables or combine together their, their tuples where there is a, uh, a matching between tuples in a tuple in one, the, the first relation 
and a mat or the corresponding match in the second relation. And we would do this based on their common common values and their attributes. So what I mean by that, in, in this example here, I have relation R and I have relation S. They both have the same schema, right? They both have two, two, two attributes, A ID, B ID. So if I take a join operator on them, then I would look for every single tuple in R. I would check to see whether there, is, there exists a tuple in S with the same A ID and B ID. And the way this works in relational algebra is that it look for, looks for matches on the, the, with, with attributes on the same name. So what I mean by that is if I ended up changing this, uh, the, the, the second attribute name in S, and I called it X, Y, Z, when I did my join here, it wouldn't do the comparison with the B ID. It would only look at A ID in these two relations because that's, that's the only ones that match. So again, this is, this is sort of like a Cartesian product uh, in that, but, but you're actually doing, you're actually checking to see whether there are matches here, where the Cartesian product just sort of takes everything. So joins are a, uh, a very important part of database systems. It's where people spend, usually spend most of the time. And so this is actually something we're going to focus a lot on this course. Um, in terms of writing this in SQL, this particular example is what's called a natural join um, because we're not specifying exactly what columns we or attributes we want to use to compute the join. We're looking for matches based on the, the common names. Right? So in, in SQL, there is a uh, natural join keyword you can use to, to accomplish this. It's usually not recommended to do this because if you end up changing the schema, um, your, your queries might end up turning into a cross join and it may end up producing the, not the result that you were looking for, right? Because there's nothing in this, the SQL statement here that you know, clearly defines exactly how you want to compute the join. It's sort of implicit based on the schema. And if the schema changes, the query result may change, which may not be what you want. So we're not going to cover exactly how you implement joins right now, but I just want to cover what the different join types you could possibly have. So the first one was the cross join. We already covered that. That's the same thing as a Cartesian product. The next class of joins are called inner joins. And this is what the, the natural join was part of. And so the, the inner join, the way it works is that you have to have uh, a tuple in the first relation must have a corresponding match in the second relation. And how you define that corresponding match will depend on what kind of inner join you're doing, which I'll show in the, in the next slides. I would say inner joins is probably the most common type of join you're going to have. Um, this is what you you know what people typically think of when you think of a join query. The alternative from an inner join is an outer join, and with this type of join, the the tuple in one relation does not necessarily have to have a corresponding match in an outer other relation. Whereas the inner join, you do have to have that. And again, how you define what the corresponding match is depends on what kind of join you're doing which I'll, I'll, again, I'll show in a, in a few seconds. So for inner joins, uh, there's basically four types. We've already covered natural join, um, and this is where we uh, are matching tuples in R and S, where the shared attributes uh, are equivalent, and we assume based on the name that they're equivalent. Um, I'll say also too now, the, the natural join was what, what was defined in the original relational model. Again, it's called natural because the idea is this is sort of the natural way you, you would join two relations that have the same attributes. Uh, the sort of another class of joins are, are inner joins are called theta joins or equi joins. Theta join is sort of the, the broad name of this type of join. And it's just where you're gonna match tuples between two relations using some arbitrary join predicate that's defined by theta. Um, and so if, if a theta is just going to be a quality predicate, it's like does, does AID in R equal AID in B or S, uh, then, then it's considered, considered to be a, what's called an equijoin. So again, a natural join is essentially the same thing as, as an equijoin, um, but it has the, the attributes implicit, right? So if we take a natural join, R and S, using the example before, we produce this answer. The theta join would be written like this. 
where now the theta uh, variable defines exactly how we want we want to do our join. So here it's the R the R A I D equals S A I D and the R B I D equals S B I D. And so for this, now we see in our output we're actually including all of the attributes from both uh, both R and S. Where in the natural join we only included the uh, we only included the two columns uh, once, and so I don't know exactly how theta joins are defined in the relational model, but I will say that if you run this in SQL, if you if you specify a natural join query in SQL, you will only get the attributes once. But if you run this uh, using a theta join, with actually explicitly defining exactly how you want to do the join, you will get all four attributes. Right, so you could write the query like this, select star from R, enter and join on S, and then we have an on clause where we define the theta part of our, uh, our join, and how we can join these together. And here again, we're, we're, we're explicitly defining that we're doing an inner join. Um, we can also just remove inner, and by default, you get an inner join. So you can write this as select star from R, join on S, again, with the same on clause, and you produce the same result. And then a third way to write this is just, say select star from r comma s and then in our where clause we define what the, the join predicate actually is so the any really good database system has, that has a decent optimizer will be able to identify that all these all three queries here are equivalent and execute them you know sort of using the same efficient plan that it can find i will say though i think some earlier systems would prefer to have an on clause because now you're explicitly defining exactly how to do the join and it can it can optimize for that. But if you have a decent optimizer, you can extract out the, from the where clause how you're doing the join and generate the same kind of plan. So all three of these SQL queries are, are equivalent. All right, so then the other two types of inner joins you can have are semi-joins and anti-joins. So in a semi-join, what you're gonna do is you're gonna generate a relation that contains the tuples of R that match with a tuple in S. But unlike a, a natural join, the output relation is only going to contain tuples from the first relation. Right? So if I do a semi-join R on S, and we, we designate that we're doing a semi-join by not having the vertical bar on the, on the right-hand side of the join operator, and in here I, I would just produce that the RID, the AID values and BID values for, for R and not S. And I would write that in SQL using this exist keywords where you have an inner join and any anytime there's a matching tuple in S, then our uh, we would emit our tuple from R. So we'll talk more about semi-joins uh, later on when we talk about join algorithms. I'll also say that semi-joins are really important for distributed databases because it's going to allow us to only send the the data from the the you know from the first relation and we don't have to send the, the second relation and this is important in a distributed database because going over the network is really slow and using a semi-join allows us to reduce the amount of data we have to send around the uh so related to the semi-join is the anti-join and this is where we're only going to output the tuples of r that don't have any match if any other tuple in S. And we, 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 we write this using the, this, this triangle uh, operator here to say R anti join on S. And the equivalent SQL looks like this. We use not exists and it looks exactly like the semi join. And then we'll get our output that only contains the, 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 the attributes and the tuples in R that didn't match anything with S. Our outer joins are different from inner joins. Inner joins, you always have to have a, a, a match, a corresponding match in the both two relations. And if there is no match, then no tuple gets emitted. And an outer join allows you to specify that I want to try to find a match for every tuple in the first relation with the second relation. But if I can't find a match, then I still want to output the tuple from the first relation. So in the case of a left outer join, you would write that using the join symbol with the little uh, horns pointing to what side is the uh, sort of the left outer part of it, or the outer part of it. And in this case here, well, what would happen is, say I do a left outer join on R to S. If 
there is a tuple that matches in uh, with a tuple in R with a tuple in S, then you, you would include both of them. So in this case here, the, the last tuple A3, uh, 103, this has a match in S, so you include the whole thing. But in the case of these first two relations, or first two tuples, A1, A2, they don't have a match in S, and but rather than just excluding them entirely, we end up putting null and where the values of the attributes from S would normally go. And so the reason why you'd want to do something like this is, is say you're doing something like, I, I have a list, uh, I have a database that has uh, a bunch of customers, and then I have a bunch of their orders. And I want to generate a list of all my customers, but I also want to include their the last the, the date of the last order that they made. But let's say that I have some customers that haven't placed orders yet, and I still want to include them in this list. And this is where a left outer join would help you with this. Because otherwise, we don't do a left outer join, there won't be a match from the order table, from the customer table to the order table, and therefore you uh, those tuples end up go missing. And so an outer join solves that problem. The uh, the right outer join is the same thing as the left outer join, it's just the input relations are reversed. And then the uh, the full outer join is where you can take anything from, from the, the, the right side or the left side and include them in your output even if, if they don't have a match. And so in SQL, you write this like this. In your uh, from clause, you explicitly define that you're doing a left outer join. And then you have in your own clause how you want to compute the join. All right. So some additional operators that I'm not going to go through, but just so you guys know that they exist, um, are things like renaming. It allows you to rename an attribute to a new name. Assignment allows you to take the output of, of, of one operator and actually store it in your database as a new relation. Duplicate and elimination. Um, aggregation, computing you know, min, max, average count, sum. Sorting is necessary because um, uh, and relational algebra is a relational model is is unordered sets, and oftentimes in applications you need you need your results to be sorted. So there's an additional sorting operator, and division. Uh, I'm not going to cover division at all in my you know 15 years of doing databases. I've never had to do uh, any division outside of an academic standpoint. Uh, oftentimes in courses, people uh, professors give you know they have you derive the the division operator from the other primitive operators. But again, I, I think it's completely unnecessary. It's only from an academic standpoint uh, that this actually matters. It doesn't actually appear in the real world. All right, so as I said, that covers the high level uh, relational operators that we care about. And we'll see these things appear uh, in a, uh, later on when we talk about doing query processing. Uh, but I'm gonna make an observation now that I sort of made earlier in the lecture about how the relational algebra is, although it's not writing low-level assembly or actually writing you know calls to the database to actually manipulate low-level data structures, it is still specifying at a high level exactly what steps the database system should do in order to, to process your query. So what I mean by that, use, take this example here where I want to do a join on the R and S relation, and then I want to first filter out any tuples where the B ID equals one or two. And there's two alternatives that I'm showing here. The first is where we're doing the join on R and S first, followed by then the, the, the selection filter to filter out any, any tuples where, or only include any tuples where B ID equals one or two. And then in the second example, I'm actually doing the selection on S first, to filter out uh, the tuples that I need. Then I take the output of that select operator and then do a join with R uh, to compute the answer that I want. So these seem like somewhat, you know, the same operations and the relation, a lot of these operators are commutative, so the ordering does actually doesn't matter. So both of these queries will actually produce the same result, but they can actually have a significantly different performance in actually executing them. So let's say R and S contain a billion tuples. And so in my first example, if I join R and S first, now I'm joining a table with a billion tuples with another table with another billion tuples. 
And then let's say that for my filter, where BID equals 102, let's say there's only 10 tuples in S that actually matches that. So I'm first, so I'm first going to do a join for, for between two 1 billion table or 1 billion tuple tables. Then after I produce, you know, potentially a, another relation with a billion tuples, I'm going to end up throwing away everything but 10 of them. And so if I actually do the second way where I do the filter on S first with the select, then I just find the 10 tuples that actually match. So then now when I do my join, uh, I'm only joining R with a billion tuples with just now 10 tuples. And that's going to be much, much faster to compute, use much, much less memory. Uh, if I'm in a distributed database, and I have to transfer less data over the network. Um, so in this particular example, the second relational algebra query is actually the better one to use. But if, we've, if we're given the first one, we have to execute that because that's what the, the user asks us to do. So a better approach is for the application developer just to state to the database system at a high level what query you actually want. And then let the database system figure out exactly what the best way to actually implement that query or execute that query for you. And so what I mean by that, let's say that what we want to do is we tell the data system that the query we want to, we want to, we want to execute is to, ex to retrieve all the join tuples from RNS where BID equals one or two. And so I'm saying this in English. I'm not even specifying exactly how, what steps to do. I'm just telling at a high level exactly what I want. And this is essentially what SQL is, right? SQL is, is telling the data system, here's the answer I want you to compute. I'm not telling you exactly how, how to compute it. And so, again, in, in, in our current age, this seems like the obvious thing to do because a database management system can always, almost always produce a better query plan, a more efficient query plan to ex execute your query than what the average person can write themselves. Right, there's obviously some corner cases or more really complex scenarios where maybe a human DBA can maybe do a better job. But for most queries, the data system is actually going to be in the best position to figure out the best plan for to execute your query. And this will be a reoccurring theme throughout this semester where I'll keep saying that the database management system always knows better than the human. Uh, and therefore, it should be the one that makes the decisions about certain, certain things, how to execute queries, how to store data, and other things. And so this is what SQL essentially does for us. All right, we can say exactly what we want, and the data system can figure out the best way to execute it. So the underpinning of SQL is relational calculus, because relational calculus is a non-procedural language or, or data manipulation language that allows you to operate in relational databases without specifying exactly what steps we're doing. So relational algebra still is, is at a high level, in that we're not specifying exactly what algorithm to use, like quick sort versus bubble sort for our different operators, but we're still specifying the order we want them to be executed. But in relational calculus, we just, again, we're declaring at a high level what answer we want. So there's two variants of relational calculus. There's tuple relational calculus and domain relational calculus. So tuple relational calculus is what uh, Ted Codd originally proposed uh, in his, his papers in the 1970s. And the way to think about this is that we're going to define variables that uh, will be bound to tuples, and we want to find the, tu the tuples in that relation that can satisfy whatever it is that we're trying to do, you know, our selection predicate. And in domain relational calculus, instead of looking at tu thinking about tuples, you're going to actually think about attributes, and you're going to define your query based on finding the attribute values within a relation that has the answer that you want. So let's look at an example to see, to see what I mean by this. So let's say we have a relational algebra query where we're doing a selection on R, and we want to find all the tuples where AID equals A2 and BID equals or is greater than 1 or 2. So the, in tuple relational calculus, it would look something like this, where we're going to say that we want to match a, a tuple that, where that tuple could exist anywhere in the universe, but specifically, we want to find one that was in our relation R, and that tuple satisfies our, our predicate. Right? Again, this is sort of another way of writing our selection operator, but just using the, the, the syntax of semantics of, of relational calculus. Um, 
Now, in the case of domain relational calculus, uh, you again, we're not operating over tuples, we're actually operating over attributes. And so here we define that we're looking for a sequence of attributes, AID, BID, that exist in relation R, and where those attributes have the, that satisfy our predicate that we had before to do our, our, our selection. Right, it's sort of, again, it's, these are producing the same answer in all three cases, right? All the both tuple relational calculus and domain relational calculus are equivalent to each other and to relational algebra. It's just another way of specifying how, how, what our queries are, look like. So again, this is this is all I'm really gonna say about tuple relational, or relational calculus, right? It's just for you guys to know that it actually exists. So if you ever need to go actually write your own programming language, to operate on a relational database, you could look at these things and understand how they work and then derive a programming language from that. Again, for our purposes, from a, from a from inter system internals, we only care about relational algebra. So that's really all I had to say about relational calculus, that's it. Okay, so as I showed this in before, uh, there's a bunch of different data models that are out there. Um, but now that we have a better understanding of what the relational model looks like, uh, I want to spend some time going through uh, some of these other data models uh, and we'll view them through the lens of, of understanding how the relational model works and this will allow us to understand the, 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 the advantages and disadvantages of, of each of these. So I specifically want to focus on uh, these four right here um, because these are associated with what's known as the sort of NoSQL uh, database movement. And these are, NoSQL systems are originally defined as eschewing SQL or the relational model. There's a bunch of other things that they're often characterized as doing, like not supporting transactions and other things. We'll cover that later, but let's just focus on these particular data model, or these systems from, from, from their data model. So the first one we can look at is what's called a key value data model. And this is essentially, the way to think about this is just a, Think of it as like a, a, a relation that only has two attributes, a key and a value. And the database system can store these in uh, an associative array or in, you know, depending on what programming language you're using, it could be a dictionary or hash table. And it's essentially it's gonna map a key to a, to a value. And so if we use our example from our, before, we have this artist relation or artist table. Uh, and under the key value data model, uh, the name would be the key and then the value would be a uh, composition of the year and country. And so the way this would be stored is sort of like this. You, again, you have a mapping from the key, which is the name, to the value. So now in this particular example though, the value has two attributes, right? We have year and country. And in most key value uh, database systems, the value is just a, a byte array meaning the, the, database, the, the database system doesn't know anything about what's actually being stored in it. So it doesn't know that there's two attributes and the first one's year and the second one is, is the country, right? These, it just see, sees a byte array. And so what this means is that it's up to the, to, to the application itself to interpret the contents of the value. So in our example here, we would have to uh, take our value and you know, do a split on the comma, and then convert the first uh, in the, the first entry to be the year, and the second entry to be the country. And so the the problem with this now is that if we end up changing our schema, uh, and now we have say in our in our value we have three attributes, we either need to go back and update all the our entire database uh, by hand or we need to modify our application to now deal with some values that have uh, two attributes and some values that have three attributes. And then also too, now we also need to like, uh, you know, do our casting to convert these, these the values into the type that we want. Um, and so this is actually very reminiscent of the, of the, you know, the, the days before the relational data model because we're baking into the application code exactly what our database looks like, the actual the physical storage representation. So now there are some key value database systems that actually support for compact values, meaning 
you can declare that, that the value is comprised of, of multiple attributes, and then therefore you can natively operate on them. Uh, you would need this in order to do like secondary indexes if you wanted to do a lookup to find, you know, in this example, find me all the artists that were in, in USA. You can, you know, without having uh, uh, interpretable values on, on the server side, you'd have to download every, all, the, all the contents of everything and then find the thing you're looking for. Whereas in some of these other systems, you can actually index things uh, inside, directly inside of these values. So there's a bunch of different database systems that, that are key value stores. Um, probably the most famous one would be Redis, that's often used as a caching server. Um, Amazon DynamoDB was is another famous one that was very influential. RocksDB and LMDB are embedded database systems um, that are, uh, or BerkeleyDB as well, that are, they expose a key value API. So, what I'll say is that if you squint for some database systems, uh, everything sort of looks like a key value store, and it, it depends on whether the value is actually interpretable by the database system or whether they have to do it at the application level. So, for example, in MySQL's NODB engine, at, its, at a high level, it essentially is a key value store, um, but just it knows how to interpret the values without, without relying on the application to do this. The next data model is the graph data model. And this is where uh, you're gonna represent the database as a collection of nodes and edges and the, and the relations between them. And so what's, what happens is that for each node and edge, you can annotate them with additional metadata or properties that define their contents, what they have. Right, so again, using our example of the artist and album table, uh, we would have a node that defines an artist, in this case, the Wu-Tang Clan, we would specify that it's an artist uh, node type. And then we would have separate nodes for the different albums that are out there. And then for the edges between them, that would define that a, an artist created a particular album or appeared on, on an album. So there are, um, there's no sort of standard query language that's widely adopted across all different database systems. Sparkle is probably the oldest and, and sort of most famous, um, but you know the, the major graph databases, a lot of them use different things. Um, there's a couple of these graph database systems that are out there. Neo4j is probably the most, most famous one. Infinite Graph and Stardog are, are sort of startups that are related to that in this area. Um, so I don't want to get into this debate right now. Uh, I will say that um, there's there's nothing preventing you from storing a graph database system in the relational model. St dealing with strictly from a from a data model standpoint, uh, the two are essentially equivalent. What makes these graph database systems actually maybe better at operating on graphs than a relational database is that they provide an API that allows you to do uh, uh, common graph operations natively, like walking a graph, for example. It's kind of it's kind of hard to do that in SQL. You can do it, but it's it's not trivial. So uh, there are, for most of the major uh, database systems that are out there, relational database systems, there are sort of middleware packages that you can install that provide this graph API uh, on top of relational uh, relational database. And it, it'll do all the things that these sort of special purpose database systems can do for you. Um, again, that's another debate of whether a graph database is a good idea. Um, I just want to show that th this data model exists and people are actually using it. The, the next data model is called the document data model. And now when I say document, I don't mean like a Microsoft Word file or a PDF. Uh, you can think of it as like an XML document or a JSON object. So a document is a self-contained record that contains a description of all the attributes with came, contained with it, within it, and then their corresponding values. So again, using the artist table as an example, uh, we could represent that as a, a single record in it uh, in a JSON object like this, where we have the name, and we have the year and the country, and then we have the corresponding values. We also can do in the 
in some document database systems is have some documents contain data that's not contained in other documents. So in, th in this example here, uh, if I have the ice cube document, it has the, the a city field or city attribute that contains where uh, where ice cube was born. But in my Wu Tang document, I don't have this information. So this is an example where you can define within a document, since it's supposed to be self-contained, you can define exactly what attributes it has and make me specific to just that one document. And other documents within the same collection or same table would not would not have to have those. So that's sort of this is called sort of a, a schemaless uh, database system where you don't have to define ahead of time exactly what attributes every single record has. Uh, it's left to the application developer to, to decide what, what to, to install. Another touted advantage of the document data model is that it supports nesting of documents. So remember that I said that the attributes in relational model, their values have to be uh, atomic or primitives, or so atomics or scalars. But on our document data model, what I can do is I can combine together all of the information for a single entity in my database, put them all together into a single document. And so to use an example, let's say that for the artist, the Wu-Tang Clan, I can define all in my document, all the, the basic attributes that I had at the, the original sort of high level artist relation. But now I can have inside of it uh, a, a sub document where I have a, a list of all the albums that the that the band put out. And then with each each album, they can have another sub list of all the tracks that uh, that appear on this album. And the idea here is that if I was doing this on the relational model, if I wanted to get all this information for uh, the albums from the Wu-Tang Clan and all the tracks, I would have to either write three separate queries to go get them from the different tables or do a join across three tables. And so this is this uh, uh, this idea of condensing or collapsing all the information for a particular entity in the database into a single object is called denormalization in the date in the relational model, and we'll cover that in in two lectures from now. So this is not a new idea um, of, of combining these things together. Um, it, it's been known since the 1970s. Um, furthermore, document databases aren't really a new concept uh, in, in, on their own. Yes, JSON is new, and so having a JSON database is, is somewhat novel. But the idea of storing these objects like this, I mean, it's, uh, it's, this is equivalent to storing things as XML, and there's XML databases from the early 2000s, and there were also object-oriented databases that would store objects like this directly in the database as well. So the... I don't want to get into the debate now. We'll, we'll cover this when we talk about uh, the, the normal forms and schema refinement about whether denormalization is a good idea or not. Um, in some cases, it makes sense. In some cases, it doesn't, right? So in this particular example, we talked about how this database had a many-to-many -many relationship from artists to albums. So if we denormalize everything in the way we're doing here, that means we'd end up duplicating the album information uh, multiple times for every single uh, artist that, that appears on it. And then we get the issues of like, make sure how do we keep everything in sync? How do we make sure that everything, if we, we have to change the name of something across all an album, how do we make sure we update all our records? So there's a whole bunch of those issues that we'll deal with when we talk about uh, de denormalization later. What I'll also say too is that uh, although the original relational model definition doesn't allow for this kind of stuff, um, most database systems, not relational database systems nowadays, at least the major ones, support storing JSON attributes or XML objects uh, directly inside a relational table. So you can do sort of stuff stuff like this. So in terms of what systems are out there, probably the most famous document database system is MongoDB, uh, and they're essentially a JSON database. Couchbase or CouchDB is another one that does JSON. RavenDB works on Windows. Uh, in terms of XML documents, MarkLogic was the one of the major is one of the major uh, XML database systems uh, 
uh, that came out of in the early 2000s that are, that are still around today. And as I said, most relational data systems allow you to store documents like this uh, as attributes. All right, so now the last data model I want to cover is called the column family. And so this is sort of a tricky one to understand because um, it's a hybrid data model. Um, and the way to think about it is that it's like a key value store where the key will get mapped to the value that would get mapped to is will be a column family. Now, a column family will be a sort of a collection of a number of rows where each one has one or more column names mapped to values. So it's sort of it's a, it's a multi-tier uh, data structure. So to give an example, say I have two records in my database. I have the Wu-Tang Clan and Ice Cube. And so the first part here for both of these, this would be the row key, right? This is what you would do to, to, to do the mapping to the value. And the, and the value they would get mapped to is the, uh, is the column family here. And you see that what we have are a combination of, of column names mapped to values. And this again looks like the relational data model, but the difference is that just like in the document data model where Every document within the same table or collection didn't have to have exactly the same schema. In the column family, you have the same benefit as well. So in the uh, in in the first relation here, I have year and country, but in the in, sorry the first record I have year and country, but in the second record I have year, country, and city because these are separate column families, and therefore this is this is this is permitted. This is okay. So the, as far as I know, the column family data model uh, was first came into prominence when Google put out their big table paper in the mid 2000s. And they sort of the first ones that built a system that, that did something like this. Um, and big table was used internally at Google for a long time, uh, wasn't actually available to the public and they never released it as open source, but now they offer it as, as a cloud service. You can actually get, uh, you can run on big table and get to the column family stuff. Uh, it's also actually used in two probably widely used NoSQL systems, Cassandra and HBase. Cassandra was actually written first by Facebook, and they ended up not using it at all. So they, they just open source and put it out there, and then people picked up it, pick, picked it up, and actually uh, started improving it. And, and it's widely used in a lot of places. And then HBase is a sort of an operational database system on top of, of Hadoop, a Hadoop file system that may use the column family. Cumulo is a clone of HBase or Bigtable. Uh, that was written by the NSA, and then they open sourced it and, and then forked a company based on it, which is actually kind of cool. So the major thing again, I gotta say about all of these is that all of these can be represented in the relational data model in one way or another. And a lot of the arguments that the NoSQL movement would make about why the relational model is a bad idea and why their approaches are better, I think are not accurate at all. I think that they're, they're making the same mistakes that the early opponents to the relational model made about data in independence from the actual application code. And they're also confusing uh, the independence of the, of the relational database system to actually store your data in any physical way that it wants. And it can allow you to get to the same benefits that you're getting here for these different data models, but without forcing the application to, to store the data exactly as the data model specifies. Again, we'll, we'll cover that later on when we talk about physical storage. But uh, again, the, right, the nice thing about SQL and the, and the relational data model is that it's very flexible and you, can, you have that data independence that allows you to change one versus the other without having to you know, rewrite or load the database back in. Um, I'll also say too that a lot of these NoSQL systems are actually now supporting some dialect of SQL in the relational data model. So for example, in the case of Cassandra, the recommended API to access in Cassandra is now to create tables using basically something that looks like SQL. And it sort of hides away, you know, they hide from, from the application programmer exactly how the, the column family stuff works. So again, the, the NoSQL guys were in vogue about 10 years ago, um, but then everyone's coming back around and then recognizing that the relational model was the right way to go. Um, and they're adding support for that. All right, so uh, to finish up here,
again, the, the purpose of this lecture was really just to, to show you guys what relational algebra uh, is at a, at a high level. Um, we define the different primitives that we can have to process queries on a relational database. And this will be necessary when we start talking about query planning, query optimization, and execution in a couple more lectures, because essentially what will happen is we'll, we'll, we'll take a SQL query as input, and then that'll get converted to a query plan tree that's comprised of relational operators. And then we can manipulate that, that query plan tree to produce an, an efficient query plan. And relational calculus is only necessary if you want to write your own programming language, which I, you know, for our purposes, we don't need to do. All right, so for next class, uh, we'll be doing, uh, I'll, I'll be covering advanced SQL. And the idea here is that rather than teaching you the basic SQL queries, which there are a ton of tutorials on the internet, or a lot of you guys already know, or the, and, and it's also covered in the textbook, rather than covering those rudimentary things, I'd rather, you know, sort of take a more accelerated view and cover the more advanced things that may not be in the textbook that, that you can do with SQL. Um, that you know, we'll, and we can walk some examples and see these and see these kind of things. So we'll cover these these kind of things, and then we'll 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 uh, you know give some demos and things like that with Postgres and see how it actually works. So like I said, uh, again, I apologize for not being on campus. Um, well, I'm I'm heading back in a couple of days, and well, you know, from this point on, all the the lectures will, will be uh, in class in person. So, all right, guys, take it easy. I gotta find joy. I gotta get some dinner. And uh, we'll, we'll head out. Take care.